One of my jobs here at Rackspace is to uh, study the future, particularly when it comes to cloud computing. And I, was, I thought, hey, uh, let's talk to one of the uh, top investors in the field from uh, Emergence uh, Capital who uh, invested in things like Salesforce and, and many other companies. We're going to hear what the future is all about from his point of view right now. I am Kevin Spain. I'm a general partner at Emergence Capital, and we are the leading investor in early stage enterprise cloud companies. Um, and when I'm, I'm not investing, I'm doing fun things like uh, building drones with my kids, which was my big uh, summer project, which we just wrapped up recently. So, um, but uh, yeah, so cloud investor by day, drone builder by night. That's how it's turned out over the last few months. That's what a lot of people in the Valley are doing. Seems that way, seems that way. So you've invested in all sorts of things from Box to Salesforce. That's the old world, right? Yeah. What's happening now? Where, where, where are you seeing the world of cloud going? Well, that's right. I mean, we, for the last 10 years as a firm, have been investing in the leading enterprise cloud companies out there. And we started with investments, with our first investment actually was in Salesforce back in the early part of the last decade, have invested in companies like Box and Yammer and uh, Viva Systems and, and other leading companies in enterprise cloud. So we see that the, the first wave of cloud is sort of behind us, right? And many of the companies I just mentioned uh, epitomize that first wave. Yeah. That first wave really was um, horizontal cloud companies. So companies that sold to any company regardless of industry, servicing a functional need like CRM or human capital management. We see the future in many ways in a couple of key areas that are very different from where we spent the last 10 years. Yeah. The first is in what, what we're calling industry cloud. So industry specific cloud applications that know an industry better than any other company and can service the needs of that industry better than anyone else. Yeah. A great example of that is Viva Systems where we were investors since the Series A. Um, we helped that company go from a half million dollars in annual revenue up to 200 million plus in annual revenue. Uh, I just stepped off the board there last month. But this is a business that focuses on life sciences, right? So they service the needs of global pharmaceutical companies with CRM, content management, marketing applications, and they do it better than anyone on the planet. As a result... So that's sort of a competitor to Workday, I guess? But, but it's a very focused Workday? Well, they, are, they, they compete with a lot of different companies, arguably. I mean, if you think about you know, CRM or content management or uh, marketing automation, there are lots of companies in each of those given mm -hmm. spaces. But what Viva has done is they have customized those applications to be perfectly suited right, to the companies in the life sciences industry. And so as a result, if you're Pfizer or you're one of the largest pharma companies out there, you greatly prefer to work with Viva because they speak your language and they can help you become more successful. So life sciences is a great industry for industry cloud. Viva's proven that to be the case. They're now public with a $3 billion plus market cap. But we are investors in lots of industry cloud companies in areas like healthcare and education and transportation. We fundamentally believe industry cloud is, is gonna be one of the next waves. Um, the other big next wave we're talking about these days at Emergence is the wave of mobile business applications, yeah, yeah. right? So everyone is talking about mobile in the enterprise. There's no question that it's making a big impact. Yeah, I just spoke to Nestle's uh, executive team and they all had iPhones. <laughs> they all have they iPhones. Every there was on an Android phone. There. But here's the interesting question. If you talk to the executive from Nestle, yeah. right, what are they doing with these devices that they're deploying inside of their organizations? Most of the time they're using them for email, calendaring, contacts, and web browsing. Yeah. I think we haven't really fully tapped the potential of what you can do on these new platforms when it comes to building entirely new categories of applications, right? Like, are you thinking like Slack or uh, who else has been here that's done some Well, Quip, stuff? Quip could be Quip, a great example. Yeah. Slack could be a great example. Yeah. There are lots of interesting examples that cater to information workers. So people that classically have used business applications as part of their jobs, but here's the interesting thing, Robert, about these kinds of workers. They sit at desks, yeah. almost all of them, including the executives at Nestle, they have laptops, they have desktops, yeah. so they have other computing a, devices. A few of the Nestle people had iPads next to their phones. Next to their phones, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, 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 the, so there's definitely an opportunity to build some interesting mobile apps for those kinds of workers. 
But in many ways, what we're thinking about as being part of this next wave as it relates to mobile and business is actually building applications for everyone else in business. Yeah. So let me give you a few stats, this is important. So there are three billion people globally who work. Only about 20% of them are desk workers. The other 80% uh, don't sit at desks and they are in industries like retail and transportation and oil and gas, energy, healthcare in some instances. And now for the first time, they will all have a computing device with them at all times. Within five years, every one of those workers in every geography globally will have a smartphone. Yeah. And now you've got 80% of the workforce that heretofore has never had a business application to help them do their jobs available and you can build business applications for them. Yeah. So that's a greenfield, completely greenfield opportunity that not a lot of people are talking about, but in many ways I think is going to be the biggest opportunity in business when it comes to mobile. So, so uh, these new workers that haven't been reached before, whether it be a, a guy on a factory line or a retail worker, <coughs> now is reachable. Yes. And so you're gonna see like McDonald's have an internal app for all the, all the workers? Potentially, or? yes. I mean, I'll give you a great example. So we're investors in a company called Kotap. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people refer to Kotap as WhatsApp for the enterprise. Yeah. Well, what's really interesting about that kind of an application is when you go into an environment like McDonald's, right? None of the people working in a McDonald's, probably with the exception of the manager, have a McDonald's email address, yeah. right? There's no way for them to use any sort of, of digital communication amongst one another. Yeah. But now all of a sudden, if you empower them with an application like a Cotab, for the first time, they can actively communicate with each other on their phones to help them get their jobs done more effectively. So I assume that hooks into like your uh, LDAP servers to get all the uh, names and contact info of all of your workers, it, right? It, it, it can, right? Although in some cases, in fact, in many cases, particularly in these retail or let's say fast food environments, you don't even have all those workers in an LDAP sort of system. Yeah. So in many cases- they've never been on a computer. They've never been on a computer, right? So now all of a sudden, you know, uh, you, you've, got, you've got a new set of problems to solve this yeah. way. But, um, but Cotap is the, is the kind of application that sort of epitomizes this new, this new world. There's a new app called House Call coming out of San Diego, and it's so you can order your plumber or your roofer or a carbonate, anybody you need to come to your house to do right. something, hang up your HDTV, whatever. Right. And in San Diego, uh, they showed me the map of customers that was solid red. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, how did you get so many customers when yeah. I haven't even heard of you yeah. yet? And they said, well, we, built the best system for the plumber right? Uh, and the plumber forces you to get on right? because uh, everything is going to be sent through the system, Absolutely. The, the house call system. So Absolutely. you're going to see things like that where the uh, maybe the boss says, if you want to get paid, you're going to have to get that app on your phone. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. No, you'll, you'll absolutely see that. It'll be an app that. for, re, you know, telling it your vacation days or your, uh, you know, your hours or, or whatnot. A ab ab absolutely right. And, and frankly, the benefit, the benefit can be more than just, well, there can be a carrot as well as a stick, right? The carrot can be uh, it's, you uh, as a worker now have your schedule with you available it, at all times. It makes sense. I, I, um, uh, I noticed uh, on the consumer side next door is yeah. uh, taking over my neighborhood. Right. Out of 400 houses, 150 are already on next door. Right. And I just uh, talked with our president. He just got on. The same kind of thing is going to happen at work. Right. I, I think so. So it could spread without even uh, it could spread through work work without having any IT investment. Sort of like Yammer did. Well, that's a key. That's a key element I think of of enterprise cloud in general is this notion that you can have many of these applications bubble up from the bottom be adopted by individuals or work, work groups or departments. Yeah. And then ultimately, if they're successful, they can spread and take over an entire organization. Yammer, you mentioned, is a great example of this. Yeah. Something like Cotap can be adopted in exactly the same way. And unsurprisingly, the founders of Cotap were actually senior people at Yammer. So they understand that business model incredibly well. Um, so I think we'll absolutely see a lot of this grassroots adoption yeah. of cloud applications going forward. We'll also see scenarios where it doesn't make sense for something to be adopted in that way. If you imagine a heavy application like 
ERP, right? That's never going to be adopted by you know line workers, and that's still going to be an IT centric decision. So I think you'll still have both depending upon the application category. But uh, that that grassroots adoption model is powerful. Do, are you watching how the data centers are changing? Uh, you know, because uh, the database guys certainly are, right? Because they know they don't no longer need, need to wait for a, a disk to spin around to pull data off of right. it so they can rebuild their databases to be hyper fast mm -hmm. and have new capabilities. Right. Are you watching, do you watch that as an investor, the, the technology changes that are happening on data centers, like whether it's Amazon or Rackspace or Google? Or we, we, we absolutely watch it. I mean, it's been a key ingredient that has enabled so many of the enterprise cloud companies that we've invested in to yeah. build world-class applications, right? I mean, were it not for all the changes that have happened in the data center over the last decade, it wouldn't have been possible for many of the great companies we have invested in to even exist. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I view it as a, as a key enabler um, in terms of where we are today, and it probably will continue to, to be an enabler going forward. It's interesting that you said you build drones at home because yeah. I already saw a company uh, called Skycatch yeah. that's building drones for enterprise. For business, yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you watch that at all or you, I, you're staying hyper-focused on cloud? No, I, I, do, I do watch it. And, yeah. and you know, frankly, I think... Although what, Skycatch uh, says, I'm not a drone company, I'm a data company. I'm a data company, right? Which because, is really fast. Because the hardware is sort of incidental to the service fundamentally that they, that they provide. And, and I, think that's, I think that's true, right? I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, hardware is becoming an enabler, right, in many ways for lots of interesting business models. In fact, in mobile, mobile in general, right, if you think about it, we're gonna have a lot of new applications that are enabled by these new devices that are entering the workplace. The opportunity isn't as much about the device, it's more about the application that sits on top of it. And so I think that drone example is, is something very similar. This isn't something you necessarily buy off the shelf in terms of the hardware, uh, something that Skycatch, I think, is in many ways creating themselves, but the hardware is just an enabler to allow them to sell that service-based solution into a customer. I think in many ways, Glass, Google Glass, is very similar to that. Yeah, you're investing in a, in a company or two in that area. We are. We're investors in a company called Augmetics, which is actually building a very interesting industry cloud solution for doctors on Google Glass. Um, basically, the problem they solve is they help doctors eliminate the need to enter data into yeah. the electronic medical record, right? Yeah. So that is a massive problem. If you ask most doctors what their biggest pain points are, many of them, most of them I would argue would say it's data entry. Because now that all doctors have to use EMRs, they're spending between a third and a half of their day doing data entry. Yeah. Some of it when you're in the visit with them and much of it when you're not. And so Augmetics, allows a doctor to wear glass, captures all the interaction between the doctor and the patient while they're visiting with the patient, and then in the background gets all of that data, data actually entered into the electronic medical record, so all of that time spent doing data entry just goes away. Or it, it, it'll, like my drop cam at the front door of my house takes a picture right. anytime somebody goes by, that means the data is already half filled in. Exactly. And let, let's say you broke your arm. My producer just broke his el two elbows. <laughs> and so he's going to take a picture of that, right? Yeah. And then uh, maybe talk to it, and that'll uh, make his data entry job much easier later on. And he'll have an image to remind him, oh, yeah, I, I saw... <laughs> I saw some cracked ribs too, and has a picture of the right. uh, X-ray all in there, right? Exactly. Well, and you and you imagine, you know, other interesting places you can take something like this. So yeah. you, as a patient, wouldn't it be interesting in some cases to actually have a recording of your visit with the doctor, so you can remember what you're supposed to do to take care of yourself between that visit and the next visit with the doctor. Yeah. So again, that's a great example of glass being a great enabler of this amazing new service that is really game changing for the healthcare industry, but it's not as much about the hardware, right? Yeah. I mean, the hardware is great, but it's really about this great service that's built on top of it. Yeah. Um, wearables, uh, I assume we're all gonna get an Apple Watch soon. <laughs> I will, once I'll, it arrives, yeah. I, I will buy it <laughs> even if, uh, whether it's a good product or right. a shitty product. Same and here. I assume <laughs> it's gonna be a good product because yeah. uh, so many people have their legacies riding on this product because right. this is the first non-Steve Jobs product. So I assume Johnny Ives and Tim Cook are, are going to do a fairly good job with this. Sucker. It's a, it's a safe, <laughs> probably a safe bet. Yeah. Probably a safe bet. But if they don't, I still want it because I want to say it, it sucks. You know? <laughs> so it, it, that first month is going to be really interesting to yeah. see what evolves for uh, putting on your wrist 
And I think it's the gateway drug for other things on your wrist because we're soon going to have medical sensors coming out. And certainly in the right. next five years, you're going to have all sorts of things like glucose sensors, for and sure. heart rate sensors. I mean, are we seeing that in the basis watch, right? Right, right. Are you thinking about that world or, or are you investing in companies that are going to be the, uh, w the wearable work uh, hub? You know, because Apple now has the health hub right. and the home hub. Right. Seems like there will be a work hub. <laughs> yeah, there could be. There definitely, there definitely could be. I, and I think there are two ways to think about the opportunity around the intersection of wearables and business, right? One is what kinds of business applications can you put on these devices to make workers' lives more productive and easier, yeah. right? So Augmetics is a great example of that in the glass world. And glass obviously is, is probably the most prominent wearable out there uh, today in yeah. some ways in business. Um, if you think about watches, right, I'm sure we will see companies build business applications that take advantage of that form factor as well. And so we're definitely keeping our eye on that. But the other interesting intersection between wearables and business is sort of the consumer wearable intersecting with business. So you mentioned HealthKit, right, as an yeah. example. Part of what Apple, I think, wants to do with HealthKit is build a bit of a conduit between this world of wearables and consumer-facing health applications and the world of business users or businesses in the healthcare ecosystem, whether those are insurance companies or providers or what have you. So um, I think that's another way in which wearables can benefit business. If yeah. you're in healthcare in particular, that's the most obvious example, how do you capture all the data coming out of wearables and then facilitate better business decisions or better delivery of care in the case of medicine as a result of what you learn from that data. Um, Union Pacific is putting sensors underneath rails and already they're seeing 40 million hits off those sensors. Yeah. Uh, they, they watch, uh, uh, the sensors watch if the uh, cars going overhead need uh, maintenance, right. among other things. Right. Are you, and I'm seeing uh, General Electric putting sensors into jet engines and Absolutely. all sorts of other things. Uh, pistachio factories are yeah. censored up, you know. <laughs> I mean, why on not? And on. Why not? <laughs> because it makes it more efficient yeah. to study, you know, what the error rates are, uh, you know, coming through Absolutely. the line, right? Um, and other things. What are you seeing happen there? And do you see any companies that are focusing on, on this Internet of Things or the, the the contextual mm -hmm. uh, systems that are running our businesses. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, GE calls this the concept of the industrial internet, yeah. right? And they have a they have a facility out here that is really laser focused on building out that part of their business. Yeah. Um, I think that's I think that's really impactful. In fact, my first job when I came out of college was at Ford Motor Company. So I, I worked, you know, in Detroit at Ford. Spent part of my time there actually inside of plants, sort of seeing manufacturing and seeing assembly of cars. And you know, this was a number of years ago, but even then, mm -hmm. there was data that was coming off of machinery in these facilities that you knew could be used to probably make better business decisions, but probably wasn't always being used as effectively as it could. Uh, these days, we obviously have you know, much better technology. We've got better database technology. We've got better cloud technology that allows us to actually do something meaningful with this information. So, uh, the concept isn't new, right? I mean, there have been sensors inside of, let's say, manufacturing facilities yeah. for a long time that have been spitting off alerts and various data points. But what has changed is the technology to actually do something with it. And yeah. frankly, the interest among businesses in doing something with yeah. it. So I mean, the fact that you've got you know, GE out there or Union Pacific out there evangelizing the idea of doing something with this data that's coming out of these systems um, is going to be transformative in and yeah. of itself. Really cool. Yeah. When I visited Microsoft Research a couple of weeks ago, they showed me a, a new data visualization, part of which is built into Excel already. You, you put a spreadsheet in and you click a button and it puts that data on the map. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> One button, you get a, yeah. a visualization of what your data is saying. That's cool. Um, are you are you investing in things like data visualization to see new patterns, to see, um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I think um, there are clearly lots of enterprise cloud companies out there that are trying to play some role in this sort of evolving analytics world. Yeah. And um, what I think is most interesting in, that's coming out of that is more forward looking rather than backward looking. There are lots of BI platforms out there on premise and cloud based. There have been for a long time uh, that 
that basically aim to give you information on what's happened historically. But I think when you start thinking about what you can do with that data to predict what will happen or to help you make better decisions, um, that's, that's what I think is fairly exciting. So I, for example, think about um, you know, IBM's Watson. Right? What kind of role can Watson help play in decision making, right? using a lot of data that is historical, but helping you sort of imagine how it might help shape what you do in the future. Yeah. And so those kinds of cognitive computing technologies, I think are, are they're things we're definitely looking at. We've got one company in our portfolio that actually have an active partnership with Watson. And um, I think that's where you're gonna see a lot of exciting things come from in terms yeah. of what you do with data and how you analyze data. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, if you were talking to executives, uh, what would you do to slap them around and, and get them to wake up to the future? You know, what are they doing wrong? And, well, to talk to those Nestle executives. What would, what, if you were talking to them, what would you say yeah. they should be investing in and watching for? And, yeah, and yeah. Trends that are going to change their business. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great they question. Have Forty billion dollar businesses, by the way. Right. Forty. Right. Microsoft has like fourteen. So. I know it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, what what I would be what I'd be saying to Nestle is think about finding innovative vendors, in, innovative enterprise cloud vendors that understand your business, right? Mm -hmm. That aren't generic database providers or predictive analytics providers or CRM providers, but instead, in their case, understand consumer packaged goods yeah. and have focused like a laser on building tailored enterprise cloud solutions for their industry. Uh, we, for example, have a company in our portfolio called uh, Promolytics, right? And they focus on helping consumer packaged goods companies optimize their promotion spending, right, yeah. in store. Right? You could go out and try to build that if you're Nestle from some generic database technology and other technologies, but why do that? Why not work with an enterprise cloud vendor that has built that custom built solution for your industry and can help you solve this very, very big problem? Yeah. And so that's the advice I would give to any big company. Yeah. Stop thinking about this so much as you know, horizontal application technology and focus more on finding those vendors that really understand your business. Yeah. Are you uh, working on understanding where somebody is? Uh, um, I know the retail industry certainly is very interested in knowing, down to one meter, that, yeah. that's their uh, standard. They want to know, are you standing in front of the Budweiser display, right? <laughs> are you, right. Or are you, right. Uh, right. you know, or are you in the women's shoe department, right? Uh, they want to know that and yeah. they want to be able to put something on your phone sure. uh, in real time sure. about where you actually are, what, even what you're mm -hmm. looking at. Right. And there's lots of companies that are doing indoor mapping and positioning and uh, uh, yeah. New Air, Dave, Dave Matthews company is studying all the Wi-Fi stuff through there. Right. And I saw another guy who can tell where you are based on the Earth's magnet, ma magnet, magnetic fields. Really? Oh, that's interesting. Pretty crazy yeah. stuff, right? Because <laughs> the, the right. we're getting new sensors on these uh, phones. Exactly. And, and like you said, everybody's going to have a phone exactly. with, a lot of, with seven sensors at least. Exactly. Right? And maybe 12. You know? Yeah. Are you thinking about that at all? We, we are. We're thinking about it quite a bit. And I think... Um, you know, location technology, right? Whether it's more, you know, macro, right? Based on GPS coordinates or zip code or micro, right? I mean, actually having the ability to detect which aisle you're standing in or which product you're standing in front of. I think both of those are extraordinarily interesting. Um, you know, we've made one investment in, in this sort of space broadly in a company called XAD, which is doing location-based targeting for mobile advertising, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think that's one, one area where you're going to see a tremendous amount of innovation and they're seeing a tremendous amount of growth. But I think the sort of in-store, more micro-level targeting and technology is super interesting. I mean, if you look at iBeacon and, yeah. you know, there's not a retailer out there that isn't thinking about how to use this technology um, to, to do innovative things inside of their stores. And frankly, I think we're very much at the early, in the early innings of figuring out what that's going to mean and what that's going to look like, but there's no doubt there's a lot of interest there and where there's a lot of interest oh, in I business. imagine this watch, you walk into Macy's and it says, will you like help? <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> yes or no, right? Exactly. If you say yes, somebody will yeah. come right to you and go, you right. ask for help? <laughs> right. But this is, and exactly. they might have the Google Glass on, right? Right, and, exactly. And they've, got like, it all, they've got it all working. <laughs> but but this, is, this is how it works, right? I mean, the technology has to sort of find its way in first. And we're now seeing this with some of this, you know, low power Bluetooth and iBeacon technology. Okay. And then you have, you know, innovative startups and you've got customers beginning to think about how it might actually impact their business. So this is an area where there's a lot of interest. I think the technology is really cool. It works really well. In the next couple of years, we'll definitely see some pretty exciting companies emerge there. Oh, that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. 
Well, I can't see what, uh, wait to see what you invest in next because it's probably pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's change our work, you know, quite a bit. And I, we're seeing work change. Well, like Uber is a great example. Yeah. Uh, Uber, I rate the driver every every drive, right? right. I work at Rackspace, a cloud computing company. I get rated every six months by my boss. <laughs> right, right, right. So I don't have the daily feedback, uh, you know, that I should have. Like, hey, you're doing a great job today. Tomorrow, right. I might do a crappy job, right? And uh, and I can't rate my customers either, like Uber can. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Uber rates the customer in real time too. So, exactly. And it's changing how companies are built and and are run. Absolutely. Well, we've seen some companies emerge recently that are focused, for example, on this specific idea. So yeah. taking the Uber-like concept of real-time or near-continuous feedback and folding it into a more traditional work context. And I think, I think that's a really compelling concept. Um, the question is, can you change behavior in such a way that you can actually get people to embrace it? The nice thing about Uber is that they change behavior in a much bigger way than just sort of giving feedback. And they, as a result of that, they were able to fold this concept of real-time feedback on a driver right into that. Yeah. But if you don't change anything else and you just ask someone to go into some kind of app on a regular basis and give feedback on their employee, that's a, that's a bigger behavior change. And that's one of the things we, we are often thinking about when we're making an investment in an enterprise cloud company. Um, are you asking a company or a business user to change behavior? Um, because if you are, you have to recognize you need to deliver a tremendous amount of value in return. That's one place I thought Yammer was heading because Yammer had this really nice uh, dashboard of, of um, you know, how many likes I got, how right. many shares, how right. many follows, how many right. kudos, right? right? And I assume that there's going to be a system that if I like your post on the company uh, intranet app, you know, yeah that uh, you'll get a little kudo, right? right? And it might store up that after a thousand kudos, you get a raise right. or you get right. you know, a bonus or, right. you, or even you just get taken out by the CEO for dinner, right? right. Exactly. I mean, at Rackspace, we have, we have a company car that gets passed around to cool people. Right. I've never got That's it. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting that real-time feedback, Rob. Uh, no, right? <laughs> no, you know, I got to step up my game so I get right. the car. <laughs> But uh, somebody gets the car for doing yeah. a great job, right? Yeah. And something like that could be uh, done algorithmically, right? Sure, it can be. And I think, you like know, the- Cotap could do that. Right? Cotap could do that. But the idea of sort of embedding it into naturally occurring workflow or taking yeah. advantage of data exhaust, right, that is coming off of an existing set of work processes, yeah. that's very much the way to do it. You know, I was, I was actually sitting down with some Microsoft executives the other day and they were talking about this concept of, of essentially the, the, the enterprise work graph, right? Which yeah. they are uniquely in a position to, um, to, to make happen. If you think about it, like Exchange is in a very, very high percentage of businesses. They see your email, they see your calendar, they know who you're interacting with, they know who you're sharing files with if you're using SharePoint. Imagine capitalizing on that data exhaust. If you could actually mine those interactions, yeah. Um, to help do all kinds of things, right? Including making a judgment as to who's doing a good job. Uh, the team I'm on spun out a company called Help Social because uh, we ha we have a listening team, right? 24 right. hours a day, right. somebody's watching Twitter. At right. Right. <laughs> right. And now Facebook and uh, other things, Google Plus and LinkedIn. Right. Um, the tools to watch that were not good enough for us. So we right. built our own tool and now we spun it out as a company called Help Social. Do you see that happening where enterprises solve a problem inside and spin out companies like that? Do you oh, think that's sure. going to be an interesting uh, source of deal flow? For well, you? it certainly happened. I mean, the, that was the genesis of Yammer, right? Yeah. Yammer started inside of Genie, right, which was a startup, not, a, not a, an enterprise, right, but a startup, um, and, and became obviously a, a tremendous success. Um, you know, is that going to be the norm for larger organizations who sort of recognize they've built something special and are willing to spin it out? My history working in larger companies, I've worked at places like Microsoft myself, Me too. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's sort of not in their DNA to spin things out, right? And so even if they build something really cool, their inclination is to either try to productize it themselves uh, and use it internally or, or just sort of let it, let it die, right, mm -hmm. frankly. So um, I don't think that's the norm, but we, act, we have seen it happen in some cases. Do you have any feedback for the platform vendors, the Amazons, the Rackspaces, the Googles? What, do you need something from us that isn't yet possible to 
uh, bring the future to yeah. us? Yeah, yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Well, first of all, I think you know Rackspace and Amazon and, and even Microsoft with Azure, you know Google now, you know getting more serious about about this area. We've seen a tremendous amount of innovation, right? So I think you know with competition comes lots of innovation. And, and you guys have been great about that, as has, I think, everybody else in this and market. We funded OpenStack, right? An open source version of the cloud. Exactly, so, so all of that has been wonderful. So I would say if I, if I have one piece of advice, it's just continue innovating, which I'm sure you will. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is just continue to think about how you can make it interesting for young companies to stay on your platforms longer, right? I mean, I think one of the, one of the things we've seen in some of our portfolio companies is when they get to a certain scale, they start asking the question, should we roll our own, right? Yeah. And it's, it's less, frankly, about cost in many cases and more about just a greater degree of control. Yeah. So continuously asking that question of entrepreneurs, what's going to make it interesting for you to well, run your business when you're at a billion dollars of revenue yeah. and not a million dollars of revenue? That's precisely why we did OpenStack and precisely why we continue to serve uh, uh, non-cloud customers. Right. Because some people need their own machine, right. <laughs> you know, exactly, or their own set of data centers, right? Now, now yeah, there's there is a cost advantage to, to doing that at, at some scale, right. right? But if you're a startup, your traffic is spiky, right? Right, exactly. And, exactly. Until you get customers and figure out what your business is and all that. Stuff. Right. So I, I would say just continue to stay really close to your customers, as I know you guys are, and get their feedback and understand what it's going to take to keep them happy over the over the long term. Where do I follow you? Are you on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn? All, all of the above. Oh, yeah. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, Twitter handle is just Kevin Spain. And um, yeah, uh, this has been great, Robert. Thanks. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you for coming in. You bet.